Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, federal complaint filed. An attorney at the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center speaks out against alleged human rights abuses at a privately owned prison in Torrance County. What was really important for advocates in this complaint was detailing the ongoing issues at this facility since it's reopened, nonstop issues. And the approach New Mexico's U.S. attorney is using to tackle gun violence and the rest of his job. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm senior producer Lou DeVizio. Denying basic rights for asylum seekers, like access to lawyers. That accusation is at the center of a federal complaint filed last month by the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center and several other advocacy groups over conditions at the Torrance County Detention Facility. In 15 minutes, New Mexico in Focus executive producer Jeff Proctor asks Sophia Genovese, an attorney with the Law Center, about the human rights abuses her group says are continuing at the prison in the mountains east of Albuquerque. Then later in the show, news about the Albuquerque stretch of the Rio Grande nearing its drying point for a second year in the row and only the second time in 40 years. I'll explain the warning from the director of the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District to people who rely on irrigation from the river. Now, as New Mexico in Focus finds its new footing this year, we wanted to take a moment tonight to reintroduce a few of our regular contributors. In the second half of our show, we sit in on a conversation with three of our lead correspondents, Gwyneth Doland, Russell Contreras, and Antonia Gonzalez, as they talk a bit about the work that our viewers can expect from them moving forward. But we begin with U.S. Attorney Alexander Ubayas in a lengthy interview as he begins his second year serving the District of New Mexico. In the first segment of this two-part conversation, New Mexico in Focus correspondent Russell Contreras asks Mr. Ubayas about his background and his work to address the state's troubled history of murdered and missing indigenous women. Alex, thank you for joining us here at New Mexico in Focus. Thank you for having me. Before we get started on uh, your role in the U.S. Attorney, take me back to where you grew up and who was your family and how did you get here? So I grew up in the Bay Area, California, um, to an immigrant mother and a father who's a high school graduate from East L.A. Um, most of my family on my father's side is still in L.A. He grew up in Lincoln Heights there and went to Lincoln High. Uh, my mother was born in China, and so immigrated here when she was about seven years old. Uh, they met in L.A. Um, my dad was a musician. He was a rocker. My mom uh, was a costume designer. And so they met, they met down there. Um, they moved up to the Bay, uh, where I was raised, uh, in the Bay Area, um, from Martinez and then high school in Oakland. Your father was, you said he was a rocker, but he was a legend to East L.A., Chicano history. Can you talk a little bit about that? Happily. I'm just so proud of my dad and, and the things that he has done in his life. It's, it's incredible how much you get done at such a young age just by being creative and passionate and community oriented. He uh, was born in the projects um, in downtown LA, actually, the William Mead Housing Projects, Vadio Dogtown, they call it. Um, then grew up uh, in Lincoln Heights. Uh, where he started a band. He taught himself how to play guitar by watching mariachis play. Um, he put together, and he just has this amazing creative mind um, for melody and for composition. And so as a teenager, he was organizing and, and running these bands out of East LA, teaching them how to, to, to orient their, their instruments and their sound. Um, and so he was a part of this band called The Romancers. He was the lead. And out of The Romancers, uh, sprung many of the bands out of East LA, but he had his finger on so many different historic moments um, in Chicano rock out of East LA in the 60s. Uh, and it's just incredible hearing the influence, you know, in, in his music and, and, and down the road. Um, he's just, he's been, he's an icon down there. And how did your mother uh, in her um, history as an immigrant coming to the States from China, how did that shape you when you get into law? Sure, there's, a lot to carry, you know, when, you're, when your folks come from overseas or over a border um, and you're the first and only attorney in the family. And so, ironically enough, the conception of, of what lawyers do to my folks um, was very much like you, you go be a lawyer, you're a professional, you go make money, right? Like you, um, you go to law school and you get a high paying job. And it, it was a thing that really confused them 
Uh, when I came out of law school and took a job here for the DA's office, making $32,000 a year. And they're like, we don't understand. <laughs> why, why was this what you did? And, um, you know, this doesn't make sense to us. And so having, you know, parents who don't come from, the, from professional backgrounds and being the first to, you know, wear a suit regularly and, and have a professional title uh, has been an interesting line to walk for me. Now, New Mexico is one of the poorest states uh, in the country. It's got deep entrenched inequalities. What w attracted you to this U.S. attorney job? Um, well, I'll start with what attracted me to New Mexico, and it's my wife. Um, she is part of a generations deep, two generations deep New Mexican families here. Um, and we've been together since we were 19. We met in college. And so ever since around then, I've been coming out here with some regularity. Um, and then we moved here in 2011. Now, I ended up, how I ended up as U.S. attorney has been um, a crazy path. It's, it's uh, really sort of a series of accidents. Um, having no guidance in my family on what it means to be a lawyer meant that I was often forging my own path. And when I ended up in law school, I really didn't have a sense of what lawyers did other than make money. And so when I got there, it was a, there was a lot of soul searching in finding the profession that, that would coincide with my morals. Um, and that's where I struggled the most, which was, and I think this, this is an affliction of the legal profession broadly, um, the, being a lawyer means you represent a single client, be it you know, an individual or a company, and you represent them at the expense of everything else. Right? That is your job. You, you are their voice in courts and through the papers. And I struggled there, right, because I'm oriented towards the community. I became, you know, I've, I've succeeded, I've, I've studied, I've graduated, and I've sought jobs because I care about the community. Um, and something in that role didn't square with me. So when I ended up in law school, I did a lot of learning about what lawyers do, um, about what the legal profession is, and then about how I can fit the legal profession into my morals and my beliefs. And so I ended up as a, as a, as a prosecutor um, first um, through the mentorship of a couple folks in my law school who showed me that as a prosecutor, and it's broadly in government service, what you do is serve the public. You have one client, but that client is the United States, right? It is all people, and as it comes to prosecutors, um, what it means is I represent not just the interest of the community broadly, but very specifically the interests of everyone in the courtroom, right? So as a prosecutor, I walk in and I represent the jury, I represent the judge, I represent the defense attorney, and I represent the defendant. And so for me, that realization of, as a prosecutor, um, I, I wear all hats simultaneously. As a prosecutor, I am a public defender first. What I do with every case when it comes in is I review it for legal sufficiency, right? Is it, is there elements of a crime? But beyond that, I review it for constitutional violations, right? Has this person's rights, the defendant's rights, been violated? And I review it on top of all of that for justice. And that is the most important component of being a prosecutor, which is our discretion to charge or not charge, um, to use the tools that we have um, to seek charges, uh, to seek prison, or to seek other alternatives. And so making all of those decisions really puts me in the, in the seat of a public defender first, and then I go into court and, and advocate once we've indicted someone or charged someone. And so the path to finding prosecution and government service was one of exploration um, and learning. Um, and that's finding my passion in it. One thing I found out about myself is that I'm really bad at things I don't care about. Um, and conversely, I'm good at things I do. And so what I've always done is follow the passion, which is tied to my community and tied to more morality. And it's led me here to this seat where I feel like I'm, I'm best expressing those abilities and those values. You come into the office at a time where law enforcement across the country aren't reporting their crimes to the FBI. New Mexico is no different. We have a number of law enforcement agencies that not only not reporting their FBI crime, but their hate crimes. What can we do to compel some of our local agencies to give us that data? Because you can't decide policy without the data. That is critical. I couldn't agree more with you about that. One thing that I've prioritized you know, in, in this position and throughout my life, and that, is, that has moved me forward amongst 
you know, in the profession um, to the position where I am today is the building of networks and teams and communities, right? And so I, when I say that I do it all for the community, it includes the community writ large as all of us in New Mexico, all of us in the nation, all of us in the world, but it also c includes smaller communities and networks that make this, make this thing work, right? And so that includes the law enforcement community. One of the things that we need to do um, is work in closer partnership with our local law enforcement um, partners um, and, and elected officials to make sure that we are, we are working towards the same goal. One of the things we've done in my office uh, since I came in uh, into the, this position was expand the amount, of, the amount of contact we had, just pure contact, with local law enforcement around the state. And the goal of keep getting everyone on the same page and moving forward to the same goals. To that effect, what we've done is create a liaison program. We have liaisons, AUSAs, federal prosecutors in my office who are responsible to go out to make, build relationships with local DAs, local sheriffs, local law enforcement, so that we can best fulfill their needs, we can best support them as partners, and they can do the same. And so I think for me, um, while there are always alternatives to compel people to do things, the better alternative is always to convince people to do things because it's the right thing to do. Now, the, the Trump administration halted DOJ reviews of police departments. The Biden administration came in, restarted uh, reviewing uh, cases of pattern of practice investigations. And stats show that New Mexico has one of the highest rates of police shootings in the nation. Many of them are Latino and Native American victims. What can your office do to address this? As the Biden administration has been very clear, we want to review police, make sure that everything's done up to par, but if their investigation is needed in a possible consent decree, they will uh, pursue it aggressively. What can your office do in that space? Sure, we've, um, as you know, partnered in a, in a consent agreement, um, well, partnered in an investigation and then in, in settling a consent, uh, consent agreement with the city of Albuquerque uh, for many years now, relating directly to a pattern and practice of excessive use of force. Um, we are unique here in New Mexico in this department in that we play an active role in partnering with DOJ, both on the investigative side um, and throughout the, the, the pendency of the consent agreement. This is pretty unique for us. We, um, because this is our community, we have always had the stance here in the United States Attorney's Office of New Mexico that we should have a voice, those of us who live here, should have a voice in how those investigations are carried out and how the consent agreement is pursued um, and implemented. And so that has been our consistent stance uh, throughout the nine years of our consent agreement uh, with, a, ter with uh, a constant attorney in our office and mo often multiple entered in on that in that case uh, to move it forward and so that that is our that is our approach um, which is very New Mexico unique and in in pursuits of and in furtherance of the Biden administration's policies here. Murdered and missing indigenous women uh, has been something you've been passionate about and you've spoken out here. Uh, is there anything else that we can do besides a public education campaign mm -hmm. to really address that. We've had a lot of tribes here in New Mexico. It's still a concern. Our tribal governments are short-staffed with police as everybody else. Is there something else that can be done in that front? Yes, I think um, there's a lot that can be done. Um, and there's a lot that we're doing. So uh, one of the things that we always need, every agency you always hear is more resources. Um, so one of the things that we have done is, is advocate at Maine Justice, and we have received um, a large number of additional positions to come to our office. Five of those, I think actually seven of those um, new positions are, are slotted for Indian Country because of the need in that area. One of those, and I announced this a couple months ago when the Not Invisible Act Commission was meeting here in Albuquerque, one of those positions is a Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Coordinator, a regional coordinator. And so this is an attorney, an AUSA, um, whose job is really unique, um, and there's, there are 10 of these around the nation. Um, that job is to coordinate efforts across all law enforcement agencies, across states and districts, to make sure that we are catching every name, right? We are catching every missing relative, and then we are investigating and pursuing each one of those, th those names and people on that data database so that we can find resolution and answers for their families. And so the number one thing here and it is, is coordination and the sharing of information. Here in New Mexico, we're lucky because the FBI, um, in, in conjunction with all of our law enforcement partners, put together a database. It's the first in the nation. It covers all of New Mexico as well as the Navajo Nation. And it's a, it's a database of missing and murdered indigenous people. With this public database, what we've been able to do is, 
is lean on the resources of many, many agencies, often whose networks and platforms and computers don't talk to each other. And by making a public-facing internet website, people have called in tips, people have called in um, information, and they've been able to remove a large number of names and, of course, update and replace um, over the past year. And so it really is coordinating the efforts, uh, making sure everyone is sharing information, and then, of course, making sure that somebody is paying attention to the names on the list so that nobody is forgotten. Every bullet that's fired, um, as we know tragically uh, from recent events, cascades in impact. Um, every piece of plastic waste we throw away, every fake fentanyl pill distributed, each of these has far-reaching impacts throughout the community. And so for me, choosing this profession as a lawyer was me rejecting this idea of, you know, we need to hold somebody to account, we need to point a finger at somebody. And instead embracing this idea of one community, our community, a mutual responsibility. Part two of Russell's interview with U.S. Attorney Ubayas is coming up in about 15 minutes. Right now, we're going to zero in on new allegations of abuse and other violations at a long-troubled prison in Estancia, the privately owned Torrance County Detention Facility, east of Albuquerque. As you'll hear in this conversation between executive producer Jeff Proctor and attorney Sophia Genovese, advocates have gathered 186 pages worth of first-person accounts and other records documenting a litany of alleged violations, including rushed interviews they say jeopardize migrant safety while unjustly damaging their opportunity for asylum. Sophia's organization, the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center, and several other groups want the federal government to shut the prison down. Sophia, thank you for joining me on New Mexico in Focus today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. We will get to your complaint that we just heard Lou talking about in a moment, but I would like to begin by sort of placing the Torrance County Detention Facility in the larger mosaic of so-called immigration enforcement in the U.S. Um, who is locked up there and what is supposed to be happening inside those walls? Sure, so Torrance County Detention Facility reopened in 2019. The facility itself is owned by Core Civic, a private prison company. And there's a few different populations detained there. ICE detainees are held pursuant to ICE contracts, as well as U.S. Marshals custody, people in pretrial criminal custody, as well as county custody, usually from the criminal legal system. And looking specifically at the immigrant detainees who are there, the contracting relationship is really interesting. So the federal government contracts with Torrance County through an intergovernmental services agreement, an IGSA. And they use these IGSAs to get around ordinary procurement requirements, competition requirements that's required when the federal government is contracting with private entities. So they use these IGSAs to get around those requirements and using the counties as a shield in the contractual relationship. The county then goes around and contracts with Core Civic to detain immigrants. And these immigrants are held in civil immigration custody. It is not criminal custody. And the vast majority of people in Torrance right now are people held in ICE detention. There's anywhere between 100 to 400 people with a capacity up to 500 people in immigration detention. And there's far fewer people held in, in Marshall's custody right now there. Let's talk a little bit about the complaint that your organization and others filed last week. It's a 186-page document. Mm -hmm. It includes some incredibly harrowing accounts, uh, firsthand accounts from folks who are being held there. Um, what are some of the themes that emerge when you read the complaint and how, as you allege, do those amount to human rights abuses? What was really important for advocates in this complaint was detailing the ongoing issues at this facility since it's reopened, nonstop issues. And so at the beginning of the complaint, we include a history of all of these abuses and how they just continue to compound and compound over time. We, of course, had the death of Kesley Vial last year, and we talked about the conditions that advocates had escalated, that the Office of Inspector General had discussed in their report calling for closure of the facility twice last year. We detailed all of that, and it culminated to a situation we began to see in January when asylum seekers were being transferred in by the hundreds after the population had dwindled to just four people on Christmas Eve. 
And beginning in January, we saw how ICE, and more specifically, the, and more broadly, the Department of Homeland Security had changed the way the facility operated to be a credible fear interview factory, an expedited removal factory where asylum seekers are quickly processed in and processed out of the facility without access to legal orientation, without due process rights, without fair review of these determinations, on top of the horrible conditions that we've been exposing for the past few years in addition to you know, poor physical infrastructure where there was recently a slip and fall because of a leaky pipe to mistreatment by ICE and core civic officials. So this complaint documents everything over the past several years that we've seen culminating now to this massive due process violation. What for viewers at home is a credible fear interview and what is the purpose of that for the asylum seeker? So under the 1996 laws that President Clinton passed, we enacted something known as expedited removal. Anyone who's crossing through the southern border is placed in expedited removal, and they can be swiftly deported back to their home country unless they state a fear of return to their home country. They claim asylum. If that happens, they are placed through a credible fear interview screening where they have to show a reasonable possibility or a significant possibility of harm if they were to return to their home country. So this is an initial preliminary screening that's not supposed to be a very high standard just so you can access the asylum system. If you fail this credible fear interview, then you are swiftly deported with very little review by an immigration judge or the agency itself to correct any erroneous decisions. Gotcha, so I don't wanna play devil's advocate too much here, but often from folks who would like to restrict immigration in the US, we hear these sort of stories about folks coming north, taking our jobs because the US is so star-spangled awesome and there's all of this opportunity here. It sounds to me like based on your interactions with clients in the past, often folks are running away from something and not towards something. What's that experience been like for you? Absolutely. I think globally right now, we're seeing people increasingly flee impacts of climate change, totalitarian regimes. They're seeking opportunities to feed their families because they may be starving in their home country. For Central and South Americans, people from the Caribbean, we're seeing people flee gang violence that's supported by governments. People are fleeing totalitarian regimes. Venezuelans who have participated in political protests are having to leave because they're being targeted by the government. People are coming to their homes. Government entities are coming to their homes, looking for them and torturing them. We are constantly meeting with people from Colombia who are being tortured by guerrilla groups and propped up by the local government to do so. We're seeing increasingly LGBTQI survivors of horrific torture across the board by government entities and guerrilla groups. So people are fleeing increasingly something. They're fleeing a harm. And there is an opportunity for safety in the United States, which is why they make the decision to come here. And to be clear, the journey all the way up to the United States through the Darien Gap up and through Mexico is incredibly dangerous. And people know this. They are taking this risk because it's less safe in their home countries. Speaking of harm, I, I can't really remember a time as a journalist in this state when I wasn't writing about the Torrance County Detention Facility. You mentioned that there have been problems there for, their, there for years. Um, it does seem that things really changed when it reopened in 2019 and they entered into the arrangement that you described between ICE and Torrance County. Do you see systemic problems with an arrangement like that and what would those be? I think nationwide we see ICE detention centers in rural areas and these jobs that are offered are not desirable. They're prone to chronic understaffing. Right now at Torrance County, they have about 60% staffing levels of just local folks who wanna work there, which is way underneath what they're required to be for the safety of not only the people that they detain, but also themselves. And we're seeing Core Civic having to fly staff in from other parts of the country just to meet adequate staffing levels at about 70%. So they're still understaffed. 
Um, it's, it's really precarious because these understaffing issues lead to staff being tired, staff mistreating the people that they're detaining, perhaps because they're tired, perhaps because they're not trained adequately enough, perhaps because there's an attitude that we need to preserve this contract. And so we're inherently going to be disrespectful to the immigrants because we just have a job to detain, deport. So I, I want to talk just a little bit about the argument that we hear from local folks in Torrance County. You mentioned a moment ago that the Inspector General for the Homeland Security Department has recommended twice that this facility be shut down. Mm -hmm. I know your group believes the same, um, as do a lot of other advocacy groups. But what we hear from Torrance County is that this would be a blow to the local economy, that they would lose jobs. How do you respond to that? Absolutely, and we take the, the issue of job loss very seriously as a coalition. We have friends, we have families based in the county, and we know that there is sometimes a trickle-down effect from the, from the prison being there. And we always point to the fact that Core Civic has left before. They left in 2017 when the, the prison was no longer profitable. So the company can always do that. It's a risky industry to be involved in. But moreover, how can we find other ways to be supportive to the communities? Uh, some of my colleague partners, my coalition partners, are out in the communities in Torrens, but also in Otero, talking to community members about what their dreams are. What do they need? And a lot of them cite to the need to have emergency medical services, more programming for, for children after school, more programming for seniors handling the water situation. We should be investing in those types of projects instead of investing in a private prison where a private prison company pockets that money. So Torrance obviously is not the only uh, privately owned ICE detention facility in New Mexico. There was a bill that gained some real traction in the legislature uh, earlier this year during the, the session um, that very nearly passed the Senate. Uh, that would have ended those kinds of relationships. What was the debate like over that bill and what ultimately was its fate? The debate over the bill on the Senate floor was really disappointing. We saw a lot of fear mongering. There was a comment that military aged men are coming across our border and insinuating that there would be some sort of revolution. And it was completely dehumanizing of what the asylum seeker experience is. Because in New Mexico, 95% of the people detained in ICE custody are recently arrived asylum seekers. They are fleeing danger. And so we saw fear mongering. We also saw a little bit about the economic impact and the facts about what the true economic impact is was ignored. And unfortunately, um, several senators who were very supportive of the bill and were going to vote yes were, were called off the Senate floor and excused. And we would have passed had those three senators been there. So it would have been a narrow victory, but a victory nonetheless. It lost 18-20 on the Senate floor, is that right? That's right. That was a disappointing debate as you just characterized it. Conversely, I understand you had an event last week um, to sort of continue the call uh, for ending these kinds of relationships in New Mexico. What was mm -hmm. that like? We held a day of remembrance on August 24th, and this marked the one year anniversary of the death of Kesley Vial. And so we continued to honor his life, to show solidarity to his family who are in the United States, that we still care, that we still want these prisons to be closed, that we don't wanna see asylum seekers detained, and also continue the call for, for ending these ICE contracts in New Mexico because these same conditions continue. Since Kesley died, there were several more suicide attempts, including of my client at Cibola. And had other asylum seekers not stepped in, he would be dead because it took 10 minutes for core civic officials to respond to the emergency. This will continue to happen until the New Mexico State Legislature decides to step in and say, we will no longer be complicit in these human rights abuses. And the day of remembrance was calling on our decision makers to really begin to take action, to take the testimonies of people who we've been uplifting for, for several years seriously. And to that end, I understand that you recently presented to the interim Courts, Corrections, and Justice Committee of the legislature. It sounds like this effort is very much alive and well. What do you think of the prospects for this bill coming back during next year's legislative session and eventually becoming law in the state? We know we have barriers because the economic challenges are a concern. We'd point to our surplus as an opportunity to help these rural economies diversify 
their, their ability for, for different jobs and industries um, as a solution to some of these economic concerns. We are also confident that we have the votes on the Senate and the House side uh, to get this through, even in a short session, but certainly in the long session in 2025. Sophia, thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks again for having me. I want to thank Sophia Genovese for that interview with Jeff. Now, we contacted the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General for a comment on the advocate's complaint. A spokesperson declined, citing department policy. Course Civic, the private company that owns the Torrance County Detention Facility, sent us a lengthy statement. Here's the relevant portion. Quote, we continue to hear claims and allegations about our Torrance County Detention Facility that are false and misleading. The reality is that we provide a safe, humane, and appropriate environment for those entrusted to us at these facilities and are constantly striving to deliver an even better standard of care. We're going to have more election coverage, and it's not just, you know, the tribal candidates and the tribal leaders, but national elections, uh, state elections, because, of course, Indian country is important when it comes to having those relationships. Of course, the federal government has a trust responsibility to tribes. It's a big constituency. Yeah, and so, you know, here in New Mexico, we have 23 tribes, and there's a lot that goes on here. That conversation between our three correspondents is coming up in less than 15 minutes. The U.S. Justice Department awarded the Albuquerque Community Safety Department more than $2 million for the city's violence intervention program. The second part of Russell's interview with the U.S. Attorney begins there. This April at a press conference when you announced a $2 million grant from the DOJ to fight violent crime in Albuquerque, you also made a passionate plea to the youth to stop gun violence. It was a very emotional plea and you spoke directly to the youth of the city. What sparked you to ask the youth of this nation, do your part and help curtail gun violence? Community. It's my firm belief that we are here together. Um, I think there's, a, there's an easy tendency, and this goes back to my first years in law school, there's an easy tendency to look at the, the format of our governments um, from the point of view of holding someone to account. Like it is my job as a lawyer to make sure that person is doing their job. Part of the cognitive dissonance for me in stepping into the legal profession was realizing that I believe we all serve a role. Um, and beyond that, we are all members of this community, right? None of us acts in a vacuum. Everything that we do at a local level between me and you, every bullet that's fired, um, as we know tragically uh, from recent events, cascades in impact. Um, every piece of plastic waste we throw away, every fake pit fentanyl pill distributed, each of these has far-reaching impacts throughout the community. And so for me, choosing this profession as a lawyer was me rejecting this idea of, you know, we need to hold somebody to account, we need to point a finger at somebody, and instead embracing this idea of one community our community, a mutual responsibility, right? Because I didn't have to end up here. Um, one of the hardest decisions in my legal career that I made was very early on um, was between what to do the summer after my 1L year. And that summer I was offered a job um, at a large law firm that, that was offering me, I think, $30,000 for about 10 weeks of my work. And instead I chose to come and work here at the New Mexico Attorney General's office. I made that decision for this community because I believe that was my responsibility to come and serve and do what I can to make this community safer. And so to your question, <laughs> which um, is about the young men um, who are driving violence in our community. They are members of this community too, right? They are people who have experienced uncounted traumas themselves and their parents have, maybe their grandparents have. And there are people too who, even if you know, we prosecute them, we send them to prison, in the vast majority of cases, they're coming back out at some point to rejoin our community. And so whether it's now or in 10 years or five years or four, they are always members of our community. And so when I talk directly to those young men, I hope to give them that message. And it's, it's a dual promise, right? And so this is what I'm so incredibly proud of the city of Albuquerque for endorsing 
um, and leaning into, which is the Violence Intervention Program here, which identifies these young men that are most at risk for shooting or being shot. And we say both of those things because it's the same population of people, right? They're the shooters and they're the victims. And you go and talk to them. And I've done this before with the, with the mayor and the chief, and we've, we've rode in caravan house to house, speaking with folk who you know, we've identified the, as most at risk, those who are driving violence. And we tell them, you know, here are the, do, here are the two promises, right? We want you to be safe, alive, and free. But the shooting has to stop. And so we will help you if you let us. City of Albuquerque is here, with this, especially with this new funding, whatever social services, they call it the, 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 the big little things, right? Diapers, bus passes, um, empl uh, employment contracts. We will help you if you let us, right? Um, and we will stop you if you make us. And we tell them this on the front end. We, you know, the federal government, um, want you to be safe, alive, and free. I don't want to have to lock you up. Um, but that is, you know, those are the dual promises that we give to the youth of this city, um, is that there is a way out, that we believe in you, and that fundamentally I believe in forgiveness and redemption. But to accomplish that, we do it together. We do it as a community, and we can't do it um, just by me saying, I'm going to lock you up. We can't do it just by saying, here is free services. We can't do it by threatening or by using the carrot on their own. The only way, and this is based, by, based in science, right? There's a lot of studies on this program that go back to the 90s in Boston where it was first created as a group violence intervention. The messages come together. The promises come together. It's only by marrying the enforcement side to the social services side on the front end and giving people the choice that people will make the right choice for this community. On that note, sometimes local governments, especially like Bernalillo County and Santa Fe County, will lean on the federal government and say, can you help us out? Because you guys do your job. We may have holes in our system and fighting crime. But on that note, someone could commit a crime in, in a local jurisdiction and get nine months. But if they do it in a federal jurisdiction on the, on the reservation, they could get seven years. There's a disparity there. Is there something that should be wedged in that disparity of sentencing between a local and a federal government? There's a giant disparity, and I think you've identified a couple really interesting issues there in terms of wh where they lie. Um, I have never been in a jurisdictional dispute with any of the local DAs here over a case. Um, it is because whenever, um, in fact, uh, over this weekend even, I received multiple emails, hey, will you help us with this case? Um, and that comes from the perception um, that I believe is, is backed up by the data, um, that when it comes to those, uh, those hard cases, those, those truly terrible cases, um, we get better outcomes against those folk who need to be take some time away from community. And so in terms of equalizing the, the disparities, and I, I believe you're right in those, the disparities between um, federal uh, prosecution and state or federal prosecution and tribal, um, it, the issue is complex, right? Because we operate under different sets of laws um, with different reasons behind those laws. Um, and different stakeholders investing in each. And so, you know, I don't write the code book. It's huge. There's thousands of things that are illegal federally. Um, nor did I, you know, write, write the New Mexico State code book or any tribal law or, um, code book. But the interesting thing about being a prosecutor is this. It's, I don't get to say what is illegal. I don't get to say whether, you know, someone's conduct um, should be a crime if it's not defined in the code book. But the most important thing about being a prosecutor is our discretion. And that is where we um, have our biggest impact on society. We have to always, as prosecutors, orient our discretion towards justice, towards community safety. What that means is when we look at a charge, we look at a case, as I was saying before, we don't just look at whether a law was violated. We look at whether this is a just thing to do. And then, what are the solutions we are seeking to the problem we're trying to solve, which is community safety? How do we achieve community safety using the tools that we have? For that reason, we've invested heavily over the past year in a number of programs that recognize this interdependence of our community. Um, we've doubled the number of cases that we've sent to pretrial diversion um, within the district. And what that means is folks who 
um, could be charged with a federal crime, but are not. And instead, what they do is they agree to be on supervision. They agree to, to accept the support, the help that we offer. And if they do that successfully, they walk away without a conviction. They walk away to be productive members of our community once again, without any encumbrances um, coming with a federal conviction. Has Rural prosecution and the Major Crimes Act led to, to justice? Yes and no, right? And so as I was saying about discretion, the code book is too big. Um, all federal crimes, all state crimes are not enforced. And so when it comes to what we do, we get, we get to choose, we should choose, when to use the tools, the Major Crimes Act, when or when not to use those tools, um, when they are effective at, at securing public safety, when somebody needs uh, a timeout, as I called it before, from the community to cool down, um, or when a person needs uh, to be supported, when a person needs to enter, for example, pre-trial diversion, when a person needs, for example, coming back to the community um, to be supported through a reentry court, which we are, we are, I'm actually really proud to say, we are setting up this district's first federal reentry court um, to work with people as they return. And so we use the tools that we have to address the community safety issues that we're faced with. But prosecution alone, incarceration alone, isn't enough to secure community safety. And so that's why the I mentioned the large number of prosecutors and additional resources I'm bringing to Indian country here in the, in the district. The goal is not just to increase prosecutions. The goal is to have an, a, a holistic approach to crime and public safety. Every one of my prosecutors in that section right now serves as, as a tribal liaison. What that means is each of them have a responsibility to a specific tribe or pueblo where they interact directly and interface directly in a government-to-government -government manner both with their governments and their law enforcement, so we can seek other options to pursue community safety. That includes everything from training, education, intervention and prevention work. And only by, as I said with the violence intervention work, marrying these multiple approaches together, which we can do as the federal government, can we bring safety to these communities. Mm. And last question, and I hear you talking, and it seems very clear where your heart is, and I know from covering uh, law enforcement, to me the prosecutor was always the hard-nosed, somewhat conservative figure. Can a progressive be an effective prosecutor? Yes. Um, I don't call myself a progressive prosecutor. Um, I call myself a prosecutor because when a prosecutor is doing his job right, he is oriented towards community safety first. And so by using these tools and thinking as a human being who's a part of this community, and not as a lawyer who fits words into statutes and argues in court, I am fulfilling my responsibility to pursue community safety and to pursue justice as a prosecutor. And so I believe very strongly that it is our role, as I was discussing um, with prosecutorial discretion to always wield that power carefully and with a mind towards the end goal. We can't prosecute every crime, nor should we. Prosecutorial discretion is a, is a valve, and it turns only one direction. It turns towards mercy. It turns against charging people. Our discretion allows us to give people mercy. And in that context, I think every prosecutor's job is to determine what is the best way in a very practical, common sense, empirical way. What is the best way to bring safety to this community with the tools that I have? And if I'm not doing that, what am I doing? Alex, thank you for joining us here on New Mexico in Focus. My pleasure. Thank it's been you. an honor. Thank you to U.S. Attorney Alexander Ubias for making time to come in and talk with us. You can expect to see Russell and the rest of our team of correspondents a bit more frequently in the coming weeks and months as we transition through longtime host Gene Grant's departure. That's why we invited our three lead correspondents to the studio together to reintroduce them to you, our audience, and to let them explain in their own words the types of stories they're interested in exploring each week. Alongside Russell Contreras and Antonia Gonzalez, here's Gwyneth Doland. 
Thanks, Lou. I'm New Mexico and Focus political correspondent Gwyneth Doland, and I'm happy to be in studio today with Antonia and Russell, who you just saw interviewing the U.S. Attorney. Antonia, you've done some great work uh, here on New Mexico and Focus 2, speaking with Leona Morgan about the history of nuclear development on the Navajo Nation just a couple of weeks ago. I know I'm at the head of the table today, but not for any good reason. We've all been doing this for a long time. Um, but I want to start with you, Antonia. Can you tell us, just refresh the audience, uh, reacquaint them with you, uh, what you've done in your career so far and the type of work you are mostly doing here at this station? Well, I'm a proud citizen of the Navajo Nation and I grew up in Arizona and New Mexico. Um, I went to the University of New Mexico, got my journalism degree way back when, <laughs> long time ago. Um, and then I started out as a commercial television reporter. I had great mentors, um, famous investigative reporter Conroy Chino that's well known here in New Mexico. He was one of my mentors back in the day. Um, so I did a little bit of commercial television until I found my passion in native radio, which I've been doing for, geez, a couple decades now. Um, and it's, I'm still doing it, obviously. And of course, here, my work with New Mexico PBS, mostly covering tribal issues and mirroring a lot of the work that I'm doing on the radio. We are very fortunate to have you doing it. Russ, how about you? How long have you been a journalist? We don't have to have an exact year. <laughs> but uh, but what, what were you doing before you came to us? Well, I started uh, my career in the 90s, working in Houston, working in alternative Newsweekly publications. And then I took my career to New York and then Boston and back here. Uh, this is my second time in New Mexico. You know, the stories I cover uh, now at Axios are around race and justice, and that's looking at how race plays a role in the debates around our, our political system, what's going on. The country is becoming more diverse. It's uh, becoming younger, but yet we seem to not be able to reconcile our history, and that will spill over in how things, uh, we debate things on, about education, uh, about our political system, like who needs, who can hold office, who's eligible to hold office. These are intense debates that don't go away. And this reminds me of some of the stuff that you cover here in state government. Uh, you've been doing this for about a decade, uh, covering uh, our legislatures when it begins in January. Where can we find you when you're not uh, sticking a mic in a lawmaker's face? What are you up to now? It's, it's pretty tough uh, doing this session. As everyone knows, the legislative session just throws your regular life up in the air. But, you know, I'm teaching most of the time now. I started in alt weeklies too, Russ. Um, in the 90s, and uh, then <laughs> I spent I spent about 10 years in newspapers. Then I moved to politics online and did some radio, and then came here to TV. And I've been teaching for about 13 years. That's as long as I've been here. And I started teaching just one class at a time for fun, and now I've sort of flipped my career where I'm mostly teaching. I'm a professor now, and then I come over here to spend time with you and cover the le the legislature, do some elections, and when I ask nicely, they let me do some interviews with authors and artists, something that's a little, you know, more colorful. Gen X power, that's what I say. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We got to stick together, right? Uh, Antonia, speaking of political coverage, you've done some of that too, and that's one of your areas of expertise. Um, you have been interviewing both candidates for uh, both of the leading candidates for the Navajo Nation president ahead of last year's election. What type of stories are you really interested in doing now, moving forward? Well, we're going to have a, definitely with the election, we're going to have more election coverage, and it's not just you know, the tribal candidates and the tribal leaders, but national elections, uh, state elections, because of course, Indian country is important when it comes to having those relationships. Of course, the federal government has a trust responsibility to tribes. It's a big constituency. Yeah, and so, you know, here in New Mexico, we have 23 tribes and there's a lot that goes on here. So definitely election coverage coming up. Um, I just finished doing a couple stories in Santa Fe. One was talking to artists at the Santa Fe Indian Market and also this really neat uh, Alaska Native Parka exhibit that's being shown in Santa Fe through next to April. And so those are a couple stories that um, are gonna come out pretty soon and definitely healthcare, education, housing, anything and everything that has to do with the Native people. 
people often think that we get that we're really into our own little beats but the thing that i you know that sort of unifies us as journalists is this relentless curiosity right uh russ you've had some pretty good interviews some fairly high profile interviews in recent months you did bernalillo county's new district attorney and then the interview we just saw today with u.s attorney alex zubayes um, but then you've also spoken with authors and professors what should viewers be looking for you to do in, in the coming months? What are you really into right now? Well, when we get a guest into the studio, we, we ask them, just give me 10 minutes. I wanted you to uh, able to listen to how we dive into this person's life. We try our best here to get the guest to go beyond talking points. You know, a lot of politicians will come in here, they are very coached by political consultants, and their whole goal is not to get in trouble. We want to help get them, push them aside, and tell us something different. Look, we're in the poorest state in the nation. We have a lot of challenges here. If a politician is just sitting, throwing out uh, talking points and not giving us anything, we're not going to advance. We need to ask the tough questions. How are you different? It's not enough to say, I'm for my children's future or I'm anti-pothole. We should all be that way, <laughs> right? That remains, no, tell me something what keeps you up at night. And this reminds me of what you do as a political correspondent. You bring up a lot of things about our political landscape. You talk about reproductive rights. You've talked about redistricting. In the coming days, what are you interested in? What really captures your imagination about our political landscape? And what are you going to be doing in the next coming months? I liked what you said earlier about young people and the changing demographics and the changing ideas of the people who are starting to vote now and the people who are going to be our future lawmakers. We've got a, uh, you know, a fairly fresh crop of lawmakers in Santa Fe right now. It's been, an, it's been a very interesting time of transition of power over the past five, six years. A lot of new voices up there, a lot of changes within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. All of this is making us kind of re-examine dynamics that really had been fairly stuck in place for decades. And now it's kind of a new game, which I find really interesting. Of course, this January, we're going to be talking about money, 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 because it's a budget session. Um, some of these are going to be familiar themes. Oh, hey, we've got a whole bunch of oil and gas money right now. What are we going to do with it? Um, but the nature of these conversations is different. You know, now people are talking in different ways. And, you know, we often do these things as reporters where you plan an interview and then you think, okay, what, what's she gonna say when I ask that? Okay, she's gonna say that, I know. And then I'm gonna say this, right? And you can basically kind of plan interviews out because you know this politician. With an artist, you can never predict that, right? But with politicians, you can't. But I, I'm finding this harder and harder. And that's what's keeping me really interested, you know, looking out for the people who are now my students, who are gonna be graduating, getting real jobs in news, and then buying houses and becoming members of their communities and all of a sudden becoming interested in the school board and taxes and development and all these kinds of things. So I keep my students in mind when I'm doing all of this reporting, not just is this gonna be relevant to them when they see it, um, but looking out for their interests, you know? Especially as the media changes its landscape, we have to really consider how do we use media to um, hit our consumers. We got to think about newsletters. We got to think about podcasts. We got to think about non-traditional ways to go after these news consumers who are going to be shaping our state's future. Yeah, my students never watch this show at seven o'clock on Friday, but they see it on YouTube right? All the time. So we'll check in with them there. Well, it was great catching up with you all. And I look forward to working with you in the coming months and doing some really great television. Thank you. Thank you, Gwyneth, Antonia, and Russell. We're all looking forward to your stories in the coming months. Of course, you can always expect to see plenty of original journalism from Our Land senior producer, Laura Pascas here on New Mexico in Focus. One of the stories she has her eye on right now is the Rio Grande drying south of Socorro with the river's Albuquerque stretch expected to reach that point in a matter of days. Here's a look at the river earlier this week on Albuquerque's north side. If and when it dries in the city, it will be just the second time in 40 years, last year being the first. The Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District has warned farmers that deliveries may take longer than usual or stop entirely with no more irrigation water left in storage in upstream reservoirs. The district has also suggested farmers reconsider planting fall crops. 
the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation is working with the Irrigation District and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to release extra water to specific parts of the river where the endangered silvery minnow lives. Officials want to keep more of the tiny fish alive while leaving at least some water in the river in the area. This is something Laura and our entire team at NMPBS will be watching closely. You can read more about it in Laura's Our Land Weekly newsletter. You can sign up or scroll through on the New Mexico in Focus website. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the viewers like you.